Five Myths of nu about Nuclear Weapons is a kind of an introduction. And it, uh, it talks about five of the things that nuclear weapons believers believe that aren't factual or based, sound, or, or based on sound reasoning. The first is that nuclear weapons uh, forced the Japanese to surrender at the end of World War II. There's always been a lot of question about this. Recent research shows that uh, it's highly unlikely that the Japanese surrendered because of nuclear weapons. They surrendered because the Soviets came into the war. The night before we bombed Nagasaki, the Soviet Union declares war they bring uh, 1.5 million men into the battle. They, and, and historically, when a great power joins a war, it always forces everyone involved in that conflict to recalculate whether they can win or not. So it makes sense that the Japanese saw that the Russians had come in and that changed everything about their, their thinking about their odds for winning. And besides that, we bombed 68 of their cities in the summer of 1945. If you graph all 68 of those attacks, uh, in terms of the number of people immediately killed, Hiroshima is second. Tokyo, uh, conventional bombing is first. If you graph the square miles destroyed, Hiroshima is sixth. If you graph the percentage of the city destroyed, Hiroshima is 17th. So there's new evidence. Uh, there's a great deal more evidence. I'm a historian, I love to talk about this, but. I'll try to restrain myself. Um, and it, it significantly changes our view of nuclear weapons writ large because Hiroshima was the first impression. It was the, the notion that set up all the subsequent thinking. And if we change how we think about, about Hiroshima, it changes everything. So that's one. Two, uh, there's a belief in the 50s that with the invention of hydrogen bombs, uh, nuclear weapons were therefore decisive. This is a silly notion. Bigger is not always better. Uh, if you have a workman and he sends his assistant to the truck to get a tool, he doesn't say, you know, uh, Darren, go get the biggest tool for the job. He says, get the right tool for the job. It's not clear that nuclear weapons are the right tool for any military job. The third is that nuclear weapons make a crisis more stable, that they are effective when we have crises. And uh, the historical evidence simply doesn't show this. Um, we have happened to live through a number of nuclear crises. There has been peace between the great powers for 70 years, but there was peace between the great powers for 100 years, between the Napoleonic Wars and World War I, and it's not clear that that long period of peace perhaps made the final outbreak to war more violent. So, um, and the final myth is that there is no alternative. We cannot eliminate nuclear weapons. And this is, this demonstrates something that I, I hope everyone can understand, which is that the arguments in favor of nuclear weapons were created by people who were afraid created by people who weren't thinking very clearly as a result. And so many of them are ludicrous. Um, you can't disinvent nuclear weapons relies on a process that is imaginary. There is no such thing as disinvention. Imagine a workshop with a guy in a white lab coat and he's disinventing IBM PCs from the 1990s. It's, it's silly. Technology changes, it evolves when people adopt it. It's based on utility. If a weapon or an implement or a tool is useful, it gets adopted and it's used. If not, it uh, gets thrown away. And um, so it's important to remember that all these arguments can be flipped on their heads and that we don't need to fight uphill all the time. So deterrence, uh, the notion that nuclear weapons have kept us safe during crises is uh, simply historically inaccurate. The uh, nuclear believers often say deterrence has been perfect because there's been no nuclear war. It's a ludicrous argument on the face of it. 
1948, uh, the Soviets uh, blockaded Berlin, and it's a situation which could easily have led to nuclear war. The United States had a monopoly on nuclear weapons, but the Soviets weren't deterred. In 1950, the Chinese uh, joined the Korean War despite the U.S. moving nuclear weapons to Guam. Uh, in 1973, uh, the Middle East War, the, everyone knew the Israelis had nuclear weapons, and yet the Egyptians and the Syrians attacked Israeli forces in the occupied territories in 1982, and so on. All of these crises, deterrence, demonstrably failed. And not only has deterrence failed in the past, it will inevitably fail in the future. Um, we uh, we are involved in nuclear deterrence. We make the threats, we evaluate them, we decide how to respond. Human beings are a part of the system. Human beings are inherently flawed. No one is perfect. If human beings are fallible, and if human beings are involved in nuclear deterrence, then nuclear deterrence, by definition, is inherently flawed. It will fail. It's not a question of if. It's just a question of when. The thing to remember about all of these arguments about nuclear weapons is that they are poorly thought out, based on false logic, sometimes not factual. We are not constantly fighting uphill in a hopeless battle. We're, we're fighting downhill because their arguments are not persuasive. Um, I was very fortunate. ICANN invited me to uh, a number of their conferences and I spoke at a number of them and um, I recently had a Facebook comment from Beatrice Finn which said um, that uh, the arguments for f from five myths about nuclear weapons framed, reframed the thinking uh, that led to the ban treaty which is an enormous compliment and um, so I I, it's hard to know what kind of impact you're having. Um, sometimes evidence pops up in the strangest places. A man at the Oman Times wrote an op-ed based on the book. I'm trolling around the internet and here's an, an op-ed by someone I have never heard of in Oman and I thought, well, that is, it's a funny world. So I. I hope it's had some impact. So the problem with nuclear weapons is that they are held in nuclear armed states. Nuclear armed states have experts and government officials who are trapped in a mindset, a kind of group think. And it's very hard for them to hear new evidence, hear contrary arguments. Um, and their point of view is largely um, not realistic. I believe we are the realists and the people who are in favor of nuclear weapons are weapons romantics. They are infatuated with these, with these weapons and um, are, uh, have exaggerated their capabilities and their influence out of all proportion with reality. So uh, I've started a group called Realist Revolt. Our job is to work at the grassroots within the largest anti, uh, within the largest nuclear armed state, the United States, and build political muscle to force experts and government officials to re-examine these questions and change their minds. I was in Nayarit, Mexico, at the second conference on that led to the treaty. And there was a moment in the afternoon on the last day that was amazing. And I think it answers your question exactly. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, speakers closing and then uh, there would be a time for diplomats from around the world to make some comments and then we would have the chairman's summary and we would be done. And people raised their hands and they wanted to speak and they continued to raise their hands and more people wanted to speak and people from diplomats from small countries in Africa and diplomats from Asia and diplomats from South America and it just went on and on the conference was supposed to end at two and it went later and later and this amazing 
outpouring of people in non diplomatic representatives in non nuclear armed states realizing that they had a voice, they had a role in this conversation. For 70 years, the nuclear armed states have told everyone else, we'll manage this, you stay home. Don't worry about this, we've got it. And I think it was at that moment that the rest of the world woke up and said, this will affect us, we have a right, we have an obligation to have our voices heard on this. And I think that's was a strong motivation that led to the, the ban treaty. And uh, I think the future involves two things. It involves more and more pressure from non-nuclear armed states and people working within nuclear armed states to undermine the myths about nuclear weapons. Well, I think in non-nuclear armed states, you can support the ban treaty. And uh, there's also a move to get banks to stop investing in companies that have, don't bank on the bomb. And I think that's an, an extraordinarily good way to bring pressure. Um, in nuclear armed states, I think people can educate themselves about the myths about nuclear weapons and then press their political leaders and say, what about the Middle East war in 1973? You say deterrence has never failed. Clearly it has. Well, why are we risking our lives for a system that can't, cannot obviously work forever. So I've worked for a long time on nuclear weapons, uh, <clears throat> at least 40 years. And uh, sometimes, uh, most of that time, it was not funded work. It was just working at nights and on weekends. And uh, it has been long and financially challenging and uh, and difficult at, at times. But I would say that working on something that matters has rewards that nothing else does. And I was thinking about this and I, I remembered this quote from uh, a skinny Indian man who once said, when I despair, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love have always won there have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time, they have seemed invincible. But in the end, they always fall. Think of it, always.